Good evening, everyone, and let me uh, start the uh, today's event again, and a very warm welcome. My name is Irina Kostko, and I'm the president of the McGill Women's Alumni Association. Um, I'm very happy to welcome you today to MWAA Muriel Roscoe Lecture. Mm -hmm. Uh, let me remind you that every woman who graduated from McGill is a member of the McGill Women's Alumni Association. We have all, all, already more than 130 years. We organize various events and uh, have our own mentorship program and also an endowment fund. Uh, this fund allows us to award uh, about $60,000 in scholarships every year to female students of McGill. As McGill approaches uh, the celebration of McGill 24 giving event, I want to emphasize that MWAA launched last year another MWAA scholarship. This particular scholarship is established uh, to help McGill female students uh, who study in STEM sector, in science, technology, engineering, or mathematics. And we are very grateful to every donor who has already helped us to raise the funds. And you will also see the direct link to our McGill MWA giving page uh, in the chat. Uh, thank you very much for your help with uh, this uh, fundraising. In addition, uh, <clears throat> To supporting current students, we also have various events throughout the year, such as Muriel Roscoe lecture as today. We usually organize this uh, lecture around May 8th, uh, oh, sorry, May, March 8th, which is an International Women's Day. And I congratulate you all with this uh, holiday today with International Women's Day. Uh, Today, we are delighted to host uh, a discussion about women, religion, and peacemaking, the tipping point. But let me introduce first our chair uh, of the event, Gawahar Atif. Gawahar Atif acquired a Bachelor of Arts in Anthropology at McGill University in 1981. Dedicated to feeding the world, Gawahar launched her career in international development in 1982. She was a project officer with Oxfam and a researcher at the American University in Cairo Desert Center. At the same time, she completed a Master of Arts degree in sociology. Gawaher has served three decades at the United Nations, including 25 years at the World Food Program. Uh, she held leadership positions in Africa, across the Middle East, and the United Nations headquarters. She was motivating teams to develop innovative solutions for fighting hunger and poverty. Gawaher is a McGill alumna, uh, alumna, vice president of our MWAA board, chair of today's Roscoe Lecture, and she will be leading in the moderated discussion today. Let's welcome Gawaher Atip. Thank you so much, Irina. It's a pleasure to be here. Ladies and gentlemen, friends and colleagues, it's a great honor for me to present you today, my, my dear friend and former colleague, her Excellency Dr. Azza Karam, the Secretary General of Religions for Peace. Dr. Karam also holds a professorship of religion and development at Vrie Universiteit in Amsterdam, Holland. She currently also serves as a member of the United Nations Secretary General's High Level Advisory Board on Effective Multilateralism. Previously, Azza served for nearly two decades at the United Nations especially at the UN Development Program and the UN Fund for Population Activities. As well, she, co she was coordinator of the Arab Human Development Report, a senior advisor on culture and lead facilitator and trainer for the UN Strategic Learning Exchange on Religion, Development and Diplomacy. She founded and was convener of the United Nations Interagency Task Force on Religion and Development as well as its, its Multi-Faith Advisory Council. Prior to that, Azza worked at the International Institute for Democracy and Electoral Assistance, the OECD, and the European Union. She has taught and lectured in various academic institutions across the globe. Dr. Karam earned her PhD in 1996, focusing on political Islam. Her thesis was later published in Arabic and English, she has since published widely in several languages on international political dynamics, including democratization, human rights, peace and security, gender, 
Religious Engagement and Sustainable Development. Dr. Karam has received many awards over the years, including an honorary doctorate of humane letters from John Cabot University in Rome, Italy. Dr. Karam was born in Egypt, lived and worked on many continents, and has been a resident in the United States for many years. Thank you so much for joining us here today. It's a great honor, Aza. Over to you for a few opening words, please. Well, first of all, thank you very much for such a gracious and um, what I would say very generous introduction. <clears throat> I was listening and wondering if it was still about me, but actually <laughs> I am really delighted to be with you all here today. And I just want to give a very special um, note of gratitude to the McGill Women's Alumni Association for the opportunity and the privilege to be with you here today. Um, I also want, before anything else, to acknowledge that I am addressing you here from a um, city called New Rochelle in Westchester, New York. And the only valuable importance of the city is that this is actually the land of the Siwanoi Indians, which uh, to whom I wish to pay tribute. Um, it is a beautiful piece and a beautiful place. And I'm just paying tribute to the original owners of this land. Um, it's a great opportunity for me to talk to you a little bit. And what I'm going to say for the next few minutes is really meant to perhaps be provocative a little bit. And I know that, um, go ahead, your questions will help us zero in and focus more on some of what should be said. But perhaps before I get restricted by what should be said in answer to the questions, let me just say a few uh, a few points about <clears throat> the reason why we have this conversation about the tipping point um, being really the role, uh, the roles played by women of faith. Um, we understand that the tipping point usually defined is the point at which a series of small changes or incidents become significant enough to cause a larger, more important change. And when we speak about peace building or peacemaking, we very often confuse it with a cessation of hostilities. Um, and we think, okay, when, when war stops uh, or when a conflict ends, peace can begin. And the truth of the matter is that that is absolutely not how things work. We know for a fact, we can imagine, we can imagine that with the current ongoing conflict in the Ukraine, even if at some point, God willing, there is a cessation of hostilities, that is not by any stretch of the imagination supposed to immediately translate into a situation of peace. It is but the beginning of a long journey that has to take place and hopefully is already taking seed at the time, but it is most certainly not the peace that we would aspire to. And that applies to every single conflict around the world. And the truth is that in every single continent around the world, there is at least one conflict taking place, if not several. And so trying to understand the role of women in conflict, that we know, we can refer to Security Council Resolution 1325. We by now know that women, peace and security is not a new area, is not by any stretch of the imagination a new conversation or discussion. In fact, we have plenty of initiatives globally, regionally and nationally that are taking place to not just acknowledge the role of women in peacemaking and peace building, but fundamentally integrate them, their opinions, their views, their experiences and their needs into the processes, the complex processes of peacemaking and peace building once there is a cessation of hostilities. But the point here is not about women in general. The point here is to try to be much more focused on the roles of women of faith. Why, you might ask, and I think this is a very valuable question, which is at the heart of what I hope we can unpack together today, because for the longest time, we have thought of the women's movement, quote unquote, which of course we know is no longer a women's movement and perhaps never was a women's movement, but we're talking about multiple women's movements around the world, that the women's movements are no are not uniform, obviously, in, in shape, 
strategy, form, content, membership. But we've never actually tried to investigate the extent to which what we understand in our common imagination as, as the women's movements are actually largely secular women's movements and or organizations and or communities and groups. And that very rarely have we taken into account the specific contributions, indeed attributions of women of faith, women who are, what do I mean by that? Women who are openly, comfortably, deliberately, and systematically um, acknowledging the role and recognizing the role of their faiths in orienting them, in determining them to be activists for girls and women's rights and for gender equality. That role that faiths play, that I can claim as, in my case, a Muslim, other sisters can claim as Buddhists, as various varieties of Christian, as Hindus, etc. That claiming of the faithful attribution and its uh, impact and on how we think about our rights, what we do to secure the rights of women, and most especially what this would mean in reconfiguring society and social cohesion post-conflict, this deliberate and systematic attribution of faith in those efforts is something that I think remains deeply understudied and underappreciated. And yet I maintain in line with that interpretation, if you will, of what it tipping point is, the culmination of the small, small, small events and initiatives. I maintain that faiths play a very critical role in serving as a tipping point in line of women, peace and security, in the roles of women, peace and security. And therefore, by extension, in the kind of society to be envisioned and to be rebuilt um, when conflicts cease, indeed already before conflict cease. So I'm maintaining based on decades of the work of the organization I have the privilege to serve now, Religions for Peace, that the roles played by various women of faith independently, but most especially together, when they serve together, when they collaborate together across their differences, that those roles are a tipping point for social cohesion in any society, and most especially in societies which are undergoing or have undergone armed conflict. That is the point that I maintain, and now I'm ready for your questions. Thank you, Aza. This was <laughs> very stimulating and thought-provoking. I'm sure our, our uh, participants are, are getting ready to, to throw questions at you, but let me, let me kick this off. Let's go back. Who is Aza Karam? Oh dear. How did you embark on such a challenging journey? So if, what are your motivations? So give us just a few words on, on who you are and who how you were driven and, and, and found, you know, take, how did you start this journey? What was your motivation? Um, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a very strong believer in human rights. Um, and I came to that space at a very early age, um, actually through the journey into and about my Islamic faith. Um, I, un I understand my, my, my faith tradition, Islam to actually be, uh, the encompassing of all that we understand as human rights, which might jolt a few people significantly at the moment. But there you go. I did say I was going to be provocative. Um, but I do understand Islam to be the fundamental foundations and affirmation of all human rights. And not just that, but land rights as well. So uh, as I became more interested in, in doing human rights work, and as I interned with a number of human rights organizations in my early life, life, I realized something very interesting, which is that the minute you mention the word religion or faith, there is one of two responses, and the never the twain shall meet, by the way. One 
response is, good grief, are you something wrong with you? Religion, really? Um, have we not suffered enough already that you think you're going to bring that issue up again? And please, please grow up kind of thing. Um, the other the other attitude is absolutely, absolutely. And therefore, we need nothing else, absolutely nothing else in this world except our faith, and it will solve all the world's problems. Now, those two positions, I think, are diametrically opposed. And quite frankly, trying to have one foot in both of these worlds has been the the defining motivation for what I do and why I do. Um, I think there's there's an under underestimation of how profound a role our faith plays and even even those of us who are deeply opposed to religion for very good reasons by the way because it's it has as it's institutionally especially continues to serve religious institutions continue to be the source of a tremendous amount of trauma and denigration and patriarchy and outright misogyny when it comes to girls and women's rights of course and so therefore there is an understandable sense of anguish um, and plain resistance to anything religious in nature. But I think we underestimate that there is also a remarkable commitment, sometimes with a very sort of narrow minded focus on religion as the end all and be all and everything good will happen because of religion. And as long as we have those polarized opposites, I think it, it significantly prevents a an engagement that is evidence-based, uh, and it significantly impedes a vision of our social space, which includes the political and the financial, economic and cultural. It is significantly impedes, this polarization impedes a revisioning of our social ecosphere. And this impediment to our social ecosphere is partly what I believe is seriously harming us today, such that we see polarization, political polarization, along the very similar lines. Those who believe that the religious have to be the end all and be all, and we therefore have to somehow reconfigure our politic politics around the religious, um, and those who believe that the religious is the ultimate harm and therefore we can see nothing, we, we have to avoid it. And I mean, polarization generally is never very helpful, but I think that polarization is part and parcel of why we see extremism on all sides. We see extremism that is that is very much about the anti the other, whatever the other is. But we also see extremism in terms of those who believe that their religion and only their religion is the uh, ultimate salvation for the entire world. And I think neither opinion or per perspective is actually quite helpful to what we we must do today in the midst of all this polarization that we are, that is the new normal, the new normal polarization. In the midst of that, we are going to have to be transcending ways of thinking, transcending polarization, deliberately finding common ground. And I believe that when, when, when faiths in their diversity are able to be a builder, um, it is the bridges that we can see being built. But as long as we start to see the polarization, and especially along faith lines, that is, I believe, the beginning of the end. So that's what motivates me. That's how I'm very fascinated by this space and this field. And it was that it was those two two polar opposite reactions. And by the way, they stayed exactly the same two polar opposite reactions until I'm here where I am right now through the decades of working in secular um, multilateral intergovernmental spaces to to working in an interreligious space where where I still come across some of those attitudes and and certainly in the context of the you know. Um, conversations around and within the United Nations today, where those two polar opposite perspectives remain very much defining some of those spaces. And so that's what motivates me to keep trying to build the bridges rather than stay on opposite sides. Extraordinary. You're an inspiration, as absolutely. I, you've always been this way. You haven't changed. And it's wonderful that you continue with the same vigor and enthusiasm in, a, in an increasingly complex world. You and I have both worked in international development at the field level, in headquarters level, negotiating with difficult in difficult contexts and with different types of players. We've in our in the work that we've done, we've had uh, uh, non-government organizations of faith collaborating with with us. We would always raise the finger and say no proselytization. That's not 
uh, uh, you know, integrate faith or have faith separate us from our goals. At the same time, you're telling us that we have to integrate faith. We have to collaborate. We have to bring the leaders of faith to the table. How do we do it? Um, I know this is a very broad question, but in a nutshell, how how can we use think, faith mm. to achieve the 2030 agenda? Sorry, over to you. No, no, thank you. It's a very good question. Um, how long did you say we have? No, um, I think <laughs> we need to take into account a couple of interesting points that the world of international development that you and I are are in a sense graduates of and 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 that will always be our key space of mentorship uh, in, in our careers. That world is defined by many, many features, one of which is the fact that we always think we're going to reinvent the wheel and we try to reinvent the wheel each and every time about each and every issue. Um, you know, multilateralism, how are we going to uh, work on multilateral? Well, let's see, what is multilateralism? Let's build networks. Let's let's think of uh, recreating the multilateral space and bringing in other members. <laughs> part of me is is often finding it very challenging to understand that why don't we just look at what we've got already and perhaps reimagine what we have recreate refashion resculpt reassess review um what we've got because we we live in remarkable remarkable times we have incredible potentials and capacities but our ways of thinking sometimes remind me more of a very primitive way of looking at things and this is black this is white and that's it um now we need to make the white black and the white and the black white and our world is so much more complex and richer than all of that and i think one of the the greatest um tensions is to is to change our mindsets it's to forcibly change our mindsets and when it comes to um dealing with faiths and faith so we we think in terms of religious institutions churches mosques synagogues temples uh, we think in terms of religious leaders not all of them are in religious institutions by the way there are many religious leaders who are not affiliated to religious institutions per se we think in terms of religious non-governmental organizations we think in terms of religious communities that's the world that's actually the world that we live in but we've somehow been especially in international uh, intergovernmental settings, we we see the world through the prism of the secular, right? So it's governments and um, intergovernmental organizations, and, and and you know sometimes NGOs, secular NGOs. If we're lucky and civil society seems to matter, then we'll look at secular civil society. That's it. And you realize that wait a minute, um, but what about the the what about the rest of the world? That eight out of ten people, and according to a Pew Research poll, eight out of ten in twenty twelve claim an affiliation with a particular religion so wait we don't look at the eight out of ten or we look at the eight out of ten but only through the prism of a secular existence either way is is problematic because you need to take into account the eight out of ten people who believe in something yeah you need to understand that there's a belief system or systems of belief that influence people and at the same time that you can't look at that through a, a purely secular prism that says, well, good, you believe that's great. Um, in the meantime, here's how we're going to do business, All right? This is what work is going to look like. But this is exactly what international development has done for decades. Um, and I think we've we've lost the essence of that which, which gives people their sense of identity, their sense of strength, especially. And I think COVID proved to so many that we kind of need to if we don't ourselves if we're not ourselves believers in anything and by the way everybody's a believer in something hmm? but if we don't want to see that we are believers in something then we have to acknowledge that in times of stress and duress and heaven knows we are in times of stress and duress if it isn't public health it is our climate it is the very oxygen and water that we need to survive and it is of course a political infrastructure that is no longer accountable or transparent and democracy that is a ripped to shreds and human right human what we live in times of tremendous stress and many people are appealing to something to something that they can hold on to that they can believe in that transcends the laws that we have today that nobody seems to be observing so i think we have to understand that it's not about the secular world finally deigning to recognize that yes perhaps religion matters to some people religion matters to most people everywhere in the world ergo we're looking at 
defunct political establishments around the world, political systems around the world that are trying to manipulate and use religion to give legitimacy and backing for themselves. If religion was so defunct, why would we see regimes trying to make very oppressive authoritarian regimes trying to make use of it? Why? Because obviously it's part of life. So in coming to terms with that, it isn't about this condescending attitude that most secular establishments tend to have about religions. Like, well, okay, if we must, let's see how we can, you know, engage one or two religious leaders, perhaps a few faith-based organizations like mine, my religious organizations, the people I can get to terms with and who'd speak like me, who talk like me, huh? Uh, it's not that attitude. It, that's actually part of the problem. That's actually what endangers endeavors towards peacemaking. But it is about acknowledging that religions matter, religions matter, not one religion or two or three religions in their diversities matter. It is there then not about trying to reinvent the wheel and build new organizations that are religious or interfaith in nature, which is, of course, the trend of international development everywhere. It's like, let's build a new organization. Let's build a new network. Let's let's found this other entity in, that's completely new. And we completely ignore that there is already a remarkable heritage of engagement. The Parliament of World Religions, just to give you one example, the Parliament of World Religions was founded in 1880 something. It still meets regularly and convenes everyone who's ever had a spiritual bone in their body, which is quite a lot of people, apparently. But the, it's one of the oldest institutions. Um, Religions for Peace has existed for over 52 years. Plenty of religious entities and organizations actually precede governments as we know them today. So one error is to be very condescending and sometimes intentionally blind about the power of faiths in people's lives and the power of religious institutions as the quintessential service providers and indeed the quintessential accountability holders in many parts of the world. The other is then to say, once you realize, well, let's see how we can best make use of this, shall we? And let's let's try to have a new organization or a new institution or a new network that's going to do what's never been done before, that will go where man has never gone before. Tr both attitudes deeply problematic. And I think that is what is at fault in international development, that we're either deliberately blind or we're instrumental in our approach and we try to make profit. And what we're seeing today is not that people are always blind. It's not that international institutions, secular as they are, are deliberately blind. We're seeing a rejuvenated interest in religion that's leading to the creation of a gazillion and one new entities, new platforms, new NGOs. And I keep having to remind us, wait a minute, do we not remember the 70s and 80s when democracy and and good governance and human rights were supposed to be the key words that everybody was working towards. Did we not also then see a proliferation of initiatives, NGOs, new entities, new organizations? New, and did it necessarily lead to a more democratic and accountable human rights world? No, it didn't, because proliferation of effort is disbursement of effort. So trying to now see a massive plethora of new entities and organizations, each of which claims this remarkable deep knowledge about religion and religious engagement is actually a danger sign. Thank you. Quite extraordinary. Um, and very stimulating. I, I'm tempted to go into the same direction, but I, I, I have so many other questions that I want to ask that are linked. So allow me to continue because you've now spoken to the development agencies. You've spoken, your response spoke to the development players. What do you tell religious leaders? I know in all your roles, and particularly in this role, you've had the opportunity to speak to the top leaders in of all the faiths. What do you tell Pope Francis? What do you tell to Sheikh Al Azhar, um, uh, how do you approach it? It's very clear to me what you're telling the development players, but how do you approach it with them to bring them on board in the same way, bring them to the table? I think one of the, you know, when I am given the time of day by these particular religious leaders you've mentioned, which doesn't exactly happen every day because I, I clearly am not the right fit um, for who they would normally see on a regular basis, but I have had the distinct privilege of meeting with His Holiness Pope Francis and His Eminence, the Grand Imam of Al-Azhar. I, I definitely have had that privilege and I'm very, I feel very blessed with it. But what I tell them is really the same thing. Number one, do you not think that 
all this wondrous work that you and your institutions do should be perhaps strengthened by working more with one another. To which the answer is, but yes, of course, that's why we did the document on human fraternity. We've, 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 got, we've done that. And the, and the response is, no, mate, wait, you did a document on human fraternity together, which is wondrous and wonderful. You're, you you continue to do encyclicals. You can, you've even set up a new organization and a foundation for human fraternity. That's grand. But, but we're talking about actually working, continuously working together, including with other faiths, some of which may not be Abrahamic at all. Um, it's that multi-religious collaboration for service to all. Do you not think that that might be important um, to do? So one response is really, well, yes, of course it is. It's, it's God's work. And so please pray for me, to which I immediately say, no, actually, you pray for me because I think your, your road up there is far quicker than mine. But then the other response is, yes, but, you know, we have to deal with some very critical issues, such as uh, these arguments about um, uh, sexual rights. And, and these are deeply, deeply antagonistic to our faith tradition, to which the response is really, this is the most important thing that we have to deal with right now. We're in the midst of all these poly crises and we're, we should be particularly concerned about that. That's what we're going to build our collaborative endeavors around. And the answer is often, oh, you poor thing, you don't really get it, do you? Yeah, there are much more serious things at stake here than, than working together collaboratively to serve everybody. We have to make sure that we keep our parameters and our boundaries about the good guys and the bad guys very, very clear. Of course, that's the main business of a religious institution, trying to save God. Um, so yes, those are some of, some of the genres of the conversation with these very, very senior most leaders. So now you understand why they don't see me frequently. But there's another very important set of conversations that is about the service that I owe to the community of, of religious institutions and faith leaders who sit on Religions for Peace and who have actually a record of working together to serve together for over 50 years. Because you see, it's not any religious leader or any religious institution that is skilled and qualified to be able to serve all and to collaborate with all. It is a particular skill. Religious diplomacy, as we call it, or multi-religious diplomacy is a skill. And it is acquired, not by virtue of having graduated from a religious establishment, it is a, or by or representing one, but it is acquired through hard labor and practice of trying to to work together collaboratively to address common issues and problems. And this is what religions for peace brings together. It convenes a very uniquely skilled set of religious leaders who represent their institutions, but that's not all. They represent their institutions and have served together for over 50 years in almost 90 countries around the world. This is a cater and a genre of religious leadership that is totally unappreciated, completely unseen by the international development, even though these faith leaders, through their contribution and collaborations, have worked on international development issues, on development, on human rights, on peace and security, all their lives. Through their collaboration, they have targeted common concerns, and they are all about protecting the commons, the global commons, and serving people together. That cater of religious leadership is the one that I am very privileged to serve in Religions for Peace. And with that cater, it isn't what I tell them. It's about what they inform and share and commit to doing together. My job as the Secretary General, emphasis on the Secretary, if you please, is to serve them to continue to catalyze at their efforts to collaborate to continue to serve in their communities. Sometimes they do this really well that some governments get very nervous because now you're seeing all of these religious leaders and their institutions working really well together and actually delivering when governments are struggling to deliver some basic things and some governments get very nervous. So the, the, the skill of diplomacy becomes even more permanent in, in, in times and spaces like the ones we have now. So I think the most important thing to share is that religious leaders and their institutions always have their interest of their interest of their institutions at stake. Per definition, that is the normal. What is not normal, but what is in fact happening and has been happening for over five decades is religious leaders who may not be the Pope and the Imam and the, 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 the most venerable and, and whatever, but they are the 
the rest of the religious leadership and communities who have a commitment and have a proven track record of working together, to me, those are the change makers. And they come in all sizes, all ages, all religions, and, uh, and all genders, by the way. And they are remarkable and amazing. And I have faith in them, if nothing else. Aza, I have to I have to quote somebody, one of our participants who said, Dr. Karam is dynamite. Aww. I couldn't have put it better myself. And I'm thanking, <laughs> thank you. thanking the, the McGill Women's alumni for inviting you. Really, you're enlightening us. And I can imagine, I can just imagine your discussions with the leaders. And I, I am sure they benefit from your from your wisdom. Uh, and because I don't think they have many opportunities to speak to people who are honest and straightforward in this way and put it on the table with your experience as well as a humanitarian and development officer. So it's quite, you're inspiring us. You really are. And I, I'm sure there are many colleagues and, and students from the from the development field that are, are learning a lot from the session as I am. Let's go to something a little bit more concrete. Recently, you and, and dozens of, of humanitarian leaders and nonprofit from nonprofit agencies uh, signed a letter to the UN Secretary General and UN agencies to underscore your concern uh, on the calamitous humanitarian situation we're in. And this was uh, done shortly after we heard the, the, the terrible news about in Afghanistan, uh, the ban against uh, uh, education for women in December 2022, which I'm sure a lot of our, our participants are aware of. Mm. Tell us more about the letter, um, your motivation, and where do we stand now? Um, the letter is one of a gazillion attempts to to try to, at a minimum, raise awareness about what's going on. Um, that it is absolutely not normal or acceptable. It is incredible that in this day and age, a government would prevent its people a significant part of its people from getting access to education and service to their communities. It is, it should be in the realms of the unimaginable, and yet it is happening. So, and there are therefore many, many attempts. Right now, the UN Commission on the Status of Women is taking place. I cannot tell you how many different events there are about Afghanistan and the concerns that are taking place there. We had our own event this morning, just talking with members from across our movement, women of faith leaders from across the movement, and including a very prominent member, a former minister um, from Afghanistan, uh, Dr. Seema, who said, the, we we live we live in an open prison um and and how is that possible in this day and age how is that even remotely possible i think the situation is so dire that it warrants us never to be silent about it and i think that's one of the things about what women of faith and women in general can do is is never to be silent i think it's one of the reasons why a lot of men get very anxious and nervous about us is we we don't usually choose silence as an option and when we decide not to choose silence as an option it can be quite terrifying but at a minimum it's a minimum thing it's um you know in in, in islam we're also told you know if you can't if you can't change something with your hands you might at the at the very minimum use your heart now it's interesting because if you use your heart you're going to have to say something your heart never stays silent forever if you really use your heart and it really impels you or propels you it'll propel you to say something and so i think there's there's this notion that as women uh actors activists etc silence is not an option silence is the death of us but therefore voice is an incredibly powerful tool and i think one of the things that that stewarded this particular effort was to say those of us who have been working in the international system know very well that we don't have to again we don't have to reinvent the wheel it's not about us having to figure out what to tell the taliban about islam it's not our job really to try to uh, make a justification for why women and women's rights and women's education should matter, that in fact, often, when the resistance and the oppression is coming from a religiously legitimizing source or a source of authority that tries to legitimize its authority through some kind of understanding of religion, that when that's the case, all the world's secular arguments, all the world's laws are a little bit like Humpty Dumpty. They will fall and not make much of an impact. At the end of the day, if, if the language of oppression 
is religious, then the language of the counter oppression, the language of resistance, and indeed the language of resilience has to also take into account the religious. You can't pretend, okay, here's religious, blah, blah, blah. blah. Oh, let's talk about secular. It doesn't work. It has never worked. That in fact, what needs to happen is that you engage with the regular with the religious discussion you engage on those points of contention and let's face it the international secular development world and indeed the international community is not equipped to discuss and deal with religious discourse and dogma and need nor need it be nor need it be we don't have to all acquire religious literacy so we can sit and have a conversation with the mullahs that's not practical and that's not what needs to happen what does need to happen is to look within that same society and identify those other religiously competent cadres of people, men and women, by the way, who can make the counter argument, who have everything at their disposal in terms of knowledge to be able to be positioned to counter the narrative of that deals with the religious as they are equally competent to speak to the rights that are secular and to the laws that are secular, international and national. You need those kinds of competencies. And in nine times out of 10, we find that in international development efforts, the local community actors who have those competencies are either completely silenced or completely invisible. To the, to the international actors who are there, in this case, the UN, or it could be the EU. They are often the, the local interlocutors, the local competencies that are religious and combining a secular awareness and a legal one are often the least approached, the least sought. So the letter was to say, have you, have you not, not to question, any approach that's already been taken, because we have to acknowledge that these actors in Afghanistan, secular as they are, are actually keeping the country alive. So they're doing plenty. It is simply to raise the question with the United Nations system and the organization of Islamic cooperation, have you engaged the local actors? Have you looked at who else there is? that are competent in these spaces of religion? Have you, as the OIC, actively justified the Islamic in the, in the title that you have to speak as multiple Islamic competencies to the other realities of this religion that are currently being completely abused? It was really to raise questions, and the questions were raised out of respect for the roles that these institutions are playing by keeping the humanitarian space alive, barely, but all of them contributing to it. So it was raised with respect to those efforts, but it was also raised with a certain amount of anguish that it shouldn't be the rest of the world trying to figure things out if, from a, a purely secular paradigm. It should be also just, can you let us know whether you've actually dealt with the local communities and are you engaging them too? Because there are plenty of capacities right there. The knowledge is right there. Um, have you tried to reach it? Have you tried to speak out and to bring out the rest of that which is also religious in nature? And it really was to question out of respect um, and out of a, an understanding that that which is obvious is not always that which gets done. And those who are very competent, and the international system is, is guilty of this, that those who are very competent are often not the ones who are immediately sought in a moment of crisis. But in fact, we tend to look because the grass is greener on the other side, when in fact, you could look right here and this grass is amazing. But we don't look right here in the international development world. We always tend to think it's out, out there somewhere else. And so it was about trying to just say, have you looked within? Have you actually looked? Within? Have you tried to activate that which is within? Extraordinary, Azza. You know, I was in Afghanistan in um, 2001 after mm. the war with the, the first phase of the Taliban. I call it the first phase, but when the first, the Taliban was there and we, the international community managed to um, uh, still deliver assistance and, uh, and, uh, and, and basically remove them from power. Um, it's very unfortunate. And it's it's actually very bad news for the international community. They're back, and I really hope that the, the the group that you're part of, that wrote the letter, will will find a way to to 
bring all the players around the table and, and get something done. I think it's a, it's a loss for the world that Afghanistan is in the situation that it's in today. Uh, it's it's one example of many countries, but it's certainly one that's hit the news, and all our participants here are are aware of it because uh, what happened in December is completely unacceptable. There's not an entity in the world, including our religious leaders, uh, who would accept that that women be banned from from schools. Let me read a comment, and you may wish to to add. It's not a question, but a comment from one of our participants. You may wish to add to that. The opposite reaction to the mention of religion that you talk about is a big barrier to working together, secular versus religious. Yet we talk about being a pluralistic society here in Canada. I feel that having conversations around what pluralism means will help us move forward, making space for voices, listening carefully and learning from each other, how to support and encourage this across all sectors. Perhaps the last part is a question, if you wish to address that or just take it as a comment. I think it's a beautiful comment. I fully concur and agree with it. I would say that addressing pluralism starts right smack within the family, within our own families, because often within the family, there are pluralistic perspectives. And sometimes we have a tendency as parents to dismiss or deny or overlook different experiences, including of our own children. And the truth is the children can teach quite a bit, can teach adults just as adults can teach children. So perhaps we could begin with these pluralistic conversations within the family. But when you go beyond and you look at communities, remember we were talking about this incredible polarization. This is the age of polarization that we are happening to live with and live in. And I think it begins because we talk pluralism, but we don't do pluralism. And this, by the way, applies also in the religious communities. It's not just because you're religious or you're a religious organization, like I, say, like I keep saying, that you therefore know exactly how to deal with other religious organizations and accept them as equals. One of the most incredible things about Religions for Peace, for instance, and I'm not trying to fly the banner, but I am, I genuinely am nourished by this, is that when religious leaders meet, they meet as peers doesn't matter what their rank is, it doesn't matter what their religion is, it doesn't matter whether they're a minority or a majority, when they meet, including with the indigenous peoples, they are peers. And I think that that attitude of pluralism that understands that no one is greater than the other by virtue of their size or their faith or their particular provenance, that attitude is also missing to a large extent from many of our religious establishments. So, and it takes two hands to clap. We don't think it's just the secular who are who are doing harm to the religious, or we don't think it's just the religious that's doing harm to the secular. In fact, we have lost the ability to disagree civilly and to realize that perhaps we are not always as right as we think we are. That we have lost in the polarized space that we are today. And so the pluralism actually does demand a certain healthy degree of self-reflexivity. I might be absolutely wrong. I might have existed for the last 150 years, but still be wrong. And so who has the courage to accept that and to come to terms with that in the religious world, for heaven's sake? I mean, God is never wrong. He's wrong. I mean, of course not. So therefore, the, my understanding of God cannot possibly, cannot possibly be wrong. Um, and God's words are they're they're eternal. And we we and of course God's words are eternal. Of course, we understand it's not a competition about that, it's not even a negation of that, but it is how do we live them? How do we live what we believe is sacred? And how do we make sacred, including of our differences? And if we make our differences sacred, meaning what? Meaning not that, oh my goodness, you now are killed me. I have to kill you because it says I have to kill you. No. When we make sacred our differences, it is to acknowledge that you might be just as right as I, and that what you think might be just as valuable as what I think. That is making sacred. It's making difference a space of sacred respect. Wonderful. How about from your experience, as broad as it is, or maybe an ideal, uh, I mean, if you if you encountered an ideal situation where partnerships with religious institutions, with different government players, non-government players, the UN, really made a difference, came together around the table, solved the problem, addressed the humanitarian context, war, brought peace, brought uh, 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 delivered assistance, something that a partnership, this ideal world that you're talking about has actually concretely helped people on the ground. Can you think of any examples? Absolutely. So 
I'm not going to tell you the whole history of the different interreligious councils of religions for peace in different countries, but I will tell you that often humanitarian disasters, be they of nature or man-made, have actually spurred and been the reason why a number of different religious institutions, religious leaders and faith communities come together to serve. So we know, for instance, that even though right now in Haiti there is trauma galore that is political and financial in nature, we also know that the Interreligious Council of Haiti came together and was a whole bunch of religious institutions and religious leaders came together to serve after the earthquake because they realized that if they could just combine their respective institutional and financial power, they could reach a lot more people. And there's one example, but the, almost every single interreligious council that Religions for Peace has, has been able to come together during moments of crisis, Bosnia and Herzegovina, um, South Africa. There, in fact, South Africa, I love to quote. Why? Because it's one of those places where the anti-apartheid struggle that was taking place by religious leaders when they came together, Bishop Tutu, remember? Um, this anti-apartheid struggle defined the interreligious council. So much so that in 94, when the elections took place and a transition to a post-apartheid government took place, that interreligious council was practically empty because everybody got co-opted into the govern the new government. And all of a sudden it's like, wait, wait, what where happened to the what happened to the <laughs> interreligious council? All the religious leaders are now very much enshrined and part of the process of transition. So the reality is that in almost all of the cases where we have interreligious structures, they have come together as a result of of severe uh, challenges that were being faced, political, financial, humanitarian. And it was a simple realization that is actually, that remains a, a, an act of genius, a simple realization that when they work together, they could get more people, do more things, and have more resources available to do so. So that's also one of the reasons why over time, when we found ourselves in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic, and we realized a very basic truth, which has been told for aeons, but nobody wants to pay any attention to it, that actually first responders in humanitarian crises, usually, if not always, are religious institutions and actors, because they're there already. They don't have to be parachuted or flown in from everywhere. They're actually there already. And so the first responders in all humanitarian crises are religious institutions. Ah, but does that mean and this is what COVID told, showed us, does that mean that the first responders work together? No, it doesn't. The first responders are doing are working at a thousand and one percent to serve and they serve everybody. The good ones among them, all of them serve everybody, but they don't serve together. They don't combine their forces together. And this is the crux of the matter. This is the tipping point. We have an example from here in New York City where uh, when New York, you may recall, was the epicenter at some point during the COVID um, lockdown crisis. And one particular religious institution of remarkable import and that does remarkable work ended up having to put together a an ICU, intensive care unit tent in Central Park. Central Park, everybody knows Central Park in New York, right? Mm. So they had to build and put it because, because that our hospitals were overflowing because private run hospitals, government run hospitals, hospitals were overflowing. So they needed an extra. They needed that space. They needed that. So there they go. The faith based organization in question set it up. It was approached by two other faith based organizations of a different faith. And the, the ask was made, can we help? And you know what the answer was? The answer was, no, it's OK. We've got this. And I always wonder about that, that it's a height of an epicenter of a public health pandemic and you've got this why because even if you have got this this is the right time to say yes thank you please join let's do this together and that's what all the other interreligious council experiences around in history have been you say i probably could do this on my own but wouldn't it make so much more sense in the long term for the sake of social cohesion for the sake of perfection of social services that we actually work together Come on board, let's do this together. But ah, you see, it means that you have to let go of that particular, um, how shall I say it, that pride in your own religion, that pride in your own institution. And that's where the problem is, right? That's where the problem is. And I think where you see efforts towards social cohesion disintegrating 
anywhere in the world, it's as a result of the fact that there hasn't been this coming together. Where you see remarkable efforts at social cohesion that have proved successful in many countries around the world, you realize that it's because they've worked together. These religious institutions, the political actors, the financial actors have worked together. And at the end of the day, one can either, it's a choice, it should, it should, it's a choice that we each make in our lives, private, in our communities and in our institutions, do we want to work together? In 99.9% .9 of the cases where religious leaders have let go of the ego of their own religious righteousness and their own religious institutional primacy and have come to serve together, that is where you see efforts of social cohesion. Hey, here in New York, in the United States, after September the 11th, some of the most beautiful examples of communities coming together, in spite of what was going on, happened because religious leaders and institutions and communities came to serve and to support and to protect one another. Whether it was Muslims protecting Sikhs, Sikhs protecting Muslims, Christians protecting both, this is where you see the communities of social cohesion being built. The civil rights movement in the United States of America that we all hear, we, we celebrate Martin Luther King Day. What was that all about? That was about religious leaders coming together with secular leaders, rel different religions, different secular orientations coming together to defend the common right of all civil rights. That made a difference. What are we looking at today? We're looking at a very bifurcated model of solidarity today everywhere in the world because we're not having those examples. So yes, you wanted examples, but I would really like to point you to the fact that the entire Religions for Peace history is replete. Every single interreligious council is an example of solidarity in spite of differences and usually at moments of heightened political, social, health, and financial tensions. Thank you, Aza. No, this was uh, you right to the point. And, I, and I'm glad you also uh, uh, brought up COVID-19 uh, uh, and 9-11 because these are crises that uh, we in, in North America have experienced recently. 9-11 um, affected many people, not only in New York. Uh, it, it hit close to home. I was living in Geneva at the time, and I remember what happened and uh, and colleagues and friends who, who were involved directly and indirectly. So it hit us home, and I'm, I'm happy you, you, you brought up the subject to see how bringing faith to the table isn't just an issue we talk about in the developing countries, but it's also something that impacts how we address crises and difficult moments in in Western countries and, and North America, which is probably the home of, of many people on, on, on this call today. Thank you. Um, you mentioned the CSW, the Commission on the Status of Women, which just started in New York. I know you attended the World Economic Forum a couple of months ago. I, I looked up some of the videos and, and the interviews you did around that and, and within the event. And <laughs> you were as outspoken then as you are with us today. And I know some people might say, ah, these big conferences, they cost a lot of money. I, uh, what is this about? In, this, in the case of the World Economic Forum, it, it truly is global. It brings in business leaders, politicians, uh, civil society, everybody around the table. What, what's the takeaway? Um, it's too soon maybe to talk about the takeaway of the CSW because it just started, but with the world, with WEF, the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland, this year, for example, a year where we're in the Ukraine war, it was in the wake of, of the uh, the um, uh, ban in, in Afghanistan on women going to school. It's uh, part, we're still reeling out of the pandemic. What was the takeaway for you? What do you think was the takeaway for others as well? I mean, I'll, I'll leave you to to take the, the answer where you wanted, but it's just to give the audience an idea of these big, huge conferences that bring all kinds of people together. What's the benefit? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think we've, I'm going to be very provocative, so please bear with me. Um, I think we have, I think we make a, a an error of judgment of sorts when we assume uh, when we we think that the convening is the actions necessary for transformation or change or response or whatever and i think we've lost touch with the fact that actually most faith traditions um remind us 
that this communion, this act of communion with one another, it's not going to solve the world's problems. It's not meant to solve the world's problems, but it is meant to be an absolutely necessary ingredient in the journey towards the solutions that need to be undertaken. The act of communion, even with God himself or the divine power itself, the act of communion is not meant to be the end to all the world's ills, even our own ills as human beings, but it is most certainly meant to be a necessary first step. As we, try, as we pray in communion with the divine, we begin a process of addressing, of asking, of determining, of reflecting. Communion is necessary for humanity. Communion is a very necessary way of existing on this planet and on this earth. And I think we, we keep getting frustrated by the fact that there's plenty of communions and we don't necessarily see how that communion led to that solution, if any, but that's not the point, is it? The point is that the minute we stop communing, the minute we stop convening, we go to war. And then we kill and we maim and we destroy because we will not talk to one another, because we will not reflect with one another, because we refuse to commune with one another. And really, it's as simple as that. The communion is a necessary first step. Actions are plentiful and need to be plentiful, but they will not take place. Positive actions will not take place without the acts of communion. And I think that's the whole point. We forgot that. And that's one of the things that I'm reminded of consistently in the space of Religions for Peace, where the coming together, and I actually dared to say this, and it was such a faux pas. I dared to say this to one of our religious leaders. I said, you know, more meetings in surely one meeting and another meeting and another meeting. No. And he looked at me and he said, but we must, we must meet and we must go on meeting. How else can we talk to one another, listen to one another, think with one another? How can we do it if we don't meet? And why, think about it for a second. It's a remarkably simple formula. It's incredibly simple, we must meet. We must meet. Oh, can we not meet? Could you could you have heard me? Could I have listened to your questions if we had not had this meeting? We must meet. But to assume that the meeting in and of itself is an act of re resolution? No, it is the beginning of a process, but we must have it. We must have it in order to be able to hold one another accountable to the reflection that we need to be with one another. So the challenge is that we've tried to, we assumed, for instance, that the United Nations was going to be that space where the the act of meeting of coming together of uniting as nations would help us would be sufficient to therefore as that saying outside the un is to no longer go to war with one another right that the act that the uniting of nations in and of itself would be how we would not be at going to war with one another and what have we learned Almost 80 years later, we've learned that the United Nations, nations as nations themselves are losing more and more credibility and legitimacy and, and political power and influence and accountability, that this, that the uniting of nations is not sufficient unto itself. Oh, so therefore we should just abolish it? No, we can't. Because if you abolish it, you abolish the moment of communion. You can't abolish it. You can improve it. You can most certainly use it to hold nations accountable, but you can't just abolish it and decide to go and do something else. But we have actually adopted that idea that, well, it's not, use it's not useful. It's not useful. It's not stopping wars. Wars are all over the place. So, you know, let's go do something else. What else can we possibly do? So we have the World Economic Forum. We have the Munich Security Conference. We have the European regional organizations. We create, but ironically, we don't realize that as we create, we are, what are we creating? We're creating other forums of communion. But we must, because you see, we must have the fora for communion. We must have a Women's Alumni Association. We must have fora for communion. Otherwise, we will not commune. And so this is the point. We don't need to see exactly what Davos was for me was an incredible stage to see how incredibly wealthy and well off institutions, corporations, individuals, organizations, how how they magnetize towards one another, how money attracts money, 
how power attracts power. And actually, plenty of really good programs, initiatives are taking place that they they catalyze together. Um, and you realize, okay, this 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 place is to observe for people like me, it's to observe, it's to learn. Um, hopefully to be able to say a few things based on experience if one is allowed to say but i think you you look at that space and you think oh gosh you know i i don't think it made any difference but it did it brought people together and 99.9 percent .9 of those who are there are happy to be together it's a moment to be it's like the u.n general assembly it's like the commission on the status of women we come together and we we tend to think oh dear it's another meeting some of us are really guilty about the meetings but my goodness gracious me we should be guilty that we want to be together that we appreciate the communion since when why would we do so we come together not because it's the only thing we do we come together because we must come together to do more and to do better and to hold each other accountable that's the point Dr. Karam, you've inspired us. Your passion is is a gives us movement, gives us hope, gives us desire to do better and more. We've come to the end of our session. I, I've taken up a lot of your time. I know you have an extremely busy schedule. We're fortunate that you you've been with us uh, for this hour and a few minutes. And before we close the session, you you. If you want to share any closing words, any final words, if you, in addition to everything you've said, I mean, we're we're all motivated. I, I have no doubt. Uh, uh, I certainly am, and I, I would have wished that this continue this discussion continue another hour or two, but it would be uh, taking up uh, a lot of your time, and um, and I know you have a lot of things to attend to. Uh, is there anything you would like to say in addition to everything else? And before I thank you once again um to uh to close the session over to you you're you're on mute you're on mute <laughs> i was yeah great now we have an indelible proof that this is a zoom um if one of us is on you uh, i just want to say thank you very much um it's it's a joy to see you go ahead it's a joy to be amongst um your community and i'm just very grateful and for this opportunity thank you thank you Aza. we're grateful to you and uh, this uh, event is rec being recorded and we'll be able to share it with a wider audience, those who couldn't make it. I know a number of people overseas who would have liked to have joined us today and, and couldn't make it because of the timing. Thank you again. Merci beaucoup. Thank you. Shukran. And uh, until we meet again, keep up the tremendous work. We need uh, we need more Azakarams in this world. Thank you. We're good. You give us faith. You give me faith. Thank you. Take much care. Take much.